All right, excellent. Welcome, guys, and good morning, and welcome to uh, FitBanker Masterclass. Uh, we do run these uh, free webinars from time to time, and the reason that we do do these webinars is we'd love to give people an insight and a snippet into uh, our programs and our education and the methodologies that we've brought together and the amazing difference uh, that they've made to multiple lives, starting with myself, and, and I'm grateful that we've been able to make a difference to multiple other people's lives in whatever walk of life they are, whatever age or stage they're in, uh, be it busy moms or doctors or lawyers or other working professionals, uh, whatever they're dealing with and however busy their uh, routines are, their responsibilities are. Welcome Tunde, we've just started. Um, we've been able to make a difference with people who take this on completely with an open mind and with people who take this on uh, with the intention of, all right, I'm going to clean slate all that I know, and I'm going to look at and discover this new approach or this new methodology, because that image of that guy on the left there started or used to still go to the gym, used to say and think, look, I eat healthy, used to say and think, well, I don't drink that much, uh, I don't eat out that much, I don't eat junk that much. Uh, all those were very true to that person there. And if you spoke to him and challenged him, he would give you every justification how he really is trying all that he's trying. He is doing everything that he knows to do, yet he's maintaining the status quo of that old body. So uh, I'm going to go through, uh, as we start this webinar, through my personal journey. But um, uh, this webinar is for you guys. So if you have any questions, uh, if you'd like clarity on a particular slide as we're going through, because there is quite a lot we're going through, uh, I say, we scheduled in an hour 15 minutes for this. It will take between an hour and hour 15. And my intention is not to go all past the 12, 15 mark so that you guys can honor your schedules. Uh, that said, uh, we just had Tunde join us. So Tunde, would you like to very quickly unmute and introduce yourself? Just let us know your name and, and where you're joining us from. Uh, and you can share anything else, anything you'd like to find out from today's webinar. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Tunde, and I'm calling from East India, London. And uh, I have, uh, um, well, I would like to get uh, more insight as to how, uh, you know, diet and a lot of different types of exercises can help me improve my health and fitness. I, uh, I sh well, I would say similar story, but I, I was quite, quite similar to you. I had, I was huge. I was about a hundred and. 20 kilos at one time and I lost quite a lot of weight but I didn't know exactly how I did it and I spiraled back into my old self yeah and I've gained more weight now so and I'm just here to learning what my blind spots are and how I can get back to that uh, uh, great body and probably hit the heights that Ron has hit with you know <laughs> his fitness journey so got it yeah. awesome Awesome. Yes. So lovely, lovely for you to share that today. And at the end, it's actually the, the last slide of the penultimate slide where we talk about what you need in place. So we're going to share first all that you guys want to hear and any questions that you want answered, please ask. I want to make sure any wants that you have in terms of knowledge to know, you do ask them on this webinar. Even if it might not be a topic that we cover, there'll be an opportunity for some, for some Q&A and we can look at what you really specifically need to know. Um, but uh, let's let's kick right in. Let's get in and understand a bit of what this this gross piece of material, this collection of tissue, of blood vessels, of fat, of muscle mass, of bone, what it is. And 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 that thing that we call our body uh, and our health is simply a byproduct. It's a function uh, of what's going on with our internal state. It's a function of things that we understand at an intellectual level, the logic, the science, and we're going to talk about some of that science. And it's also a function of our mind, how our mind really operates around the things that we, uh, the emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, our concerns. And when we really get them aligned, we get to have this body be a byproduct of a new methodology, a new science, and a new belief system. So, um, so if you look at it, if 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 we look at it. To create something new, we need to alter this underlying inner understanding, right? And when we alter that understanding, when we truly understand the science, then we begin to believe what we know works 
for us to say uh, shift something in the area of health. So I'm going to start off by giving you an example, and uh, and I will uh, want one or two of you to also share a belief that you know and you know that it's factual, like you really believe. I know this is true, what I need to do, and you know that you're not even doing it, uh, but you know it's to be true. So I'll give you an example for me. I know or I knew, um, uh, as the big guy I was with the image on the, on the left there, the first slide, I knew when I went down to the J.P. Morgan canteen, there was every day there was fresh food. There were amazing chefs there, and this catering company that ran the, ran the kitchen, ran the ca canteen, they would have this organic stuff. They would have uh, fresh pastas, fresh pizza, fresh salads. Uh, and I knew if it says organic and if it says vegetarian, this means healthy. That was at least what I believed. That was what I believed to be true. And by making those choices, I thought this is completely supporting me in being and remaining healthy. And and in that moment of time, it was true. That belief system was true for me. So um, uh, I'll, I'll give you another belief that's that's uh, a limiting belief for me. And this one is where uh, I have it that I'm not a, a fast runner. I say I'm not a fast runner. And I have been told this by people, and I believe it to be true, is that because I'm flat-footed, um, growing up, I remember somebody looking at my feet. He says, oh, someone like you will never get into the army because they say, if you're flat-footed, you can't join the army because you can't run. Uh, and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So I have a brilliant justification uh, that has been used <laughs> by the army for a long time, which says, if you're flat-footed, you can't be a runner. And, and I still believe that to be true. So I do run, but I'm a slow runner. I, I, I still believe that I cannot run unless there's something else I shift or some new piece of information I discover that will alter my running. So similarly, who'd like to share some of the beliefs they know? And a way to look at it is look at a want you have. So say you want to lose weight. What do you believe you need to do to lose weight? Or say you want to increase muscle mass. What do you believe you need to do to gain that muscle mass? So who'd like to very quickly share? Um, is it okay if I share? Yeah, go for okay. it. Um, for me, I think in my head, what I grapple with, especially when I look at, you know, people who are like properly fit, I believe they've got to go through or like it has to be very difficult to the work that entails for you to get there has to be very difficult mm -hmm. um, to do. And I feel I don't have enough time and I don't think I'm going to be able to arrange my life enough to be able to do what it is that yeah. they did to get there. That's yeah. that's one thing I, I struggle with. Yeah, got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, brilliant, brilliant share. All right, Amar, would you like to share? Uh, um, yeah, I think um, I sort of have, I've had this belief since about the age of about 20 that I'm, I'm never, I'm not an athlete. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm never going to be a, reach the levels of, for example, the fitness instructor taking the class or, you know, and everyone else in the class. For me, I just kind of judge, I, I give myself a way out and, and think that, well, as long as I train to my own levels, uh, you know, that's okay. But that's always sort of, it's always a get out of jail free card. And it's always been a justification as to why I can't, um, you know, achieve a, a much better level of fitness. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's sort of a belief that's kind of held me back a little bit. Okay, brilliant. Both of you are brilliant shares. Uh, Rocky, anything you'd like to share? Feel free to type if there's anything. I just want to make sure that you also, um, if there is issues with your, uh, same as, all right, so same as Amar. Yeah, that's Amar. We've got Amar Tunde and uh, and yourself on at the moment, and there's a few more registered who'll be joining. Okay, so brilliant. So I'll, what I want you guys to write down, if you have a notepad there or a book there, the first step to really looking at the grip our beliefs have over us, us is to distinguish them, is to write them down. And uh, and what we're going to begin to do is begin to see how they no longer have a grip over us, but we can have a grip over them. They are our beliefs. You know, we don't belong to the belief. The belief belongs to us. But most of us are completely being run by our beliefs. So Tunde, in your case, I want you to write two beliefs. One, your belief is that I need to work really, really hard. That to cause a shift for you, you have some perception or a view of what hard looks like. 
it might be a guy you know sprinting or running on the spot doing knee raises and moving his hands vigorously of maybe 108 reps in a minute or some concocted number in our mind of what hard looks like uh, or pushing a certain weight or certain uh, stacked up sled on a on a um uh, on a you know turf uh, uh, mat there's some view that you have of vision that you have that what that's what hard looks like so a, I need to work really, really hard to cause a transformation. Attached to that belief, you have this also belief that, that working that hard requires time. And you believe and you have it as real that I don't have time. And then you probably have justifications. You look at your diary in your day and you say, look, I get up at this time. I go to work at this time. I'm back at this time. There really is no time. You will even have evidence to back your belief system. So you have two beliefs. One is it's hard. And number two is that you don't have time. And so you have two brilliant beliefs and justifications that give you complete satisfaction to stay in the status quo because you get to stay in the status quo to hold and keep those beliefs alive so just note that down uh, Amr in your case you want to write down and in Rocky's case as well write down that I and you know you made this decision at a particular age I will never be as fit as the fitness instructor right who runs the class so that's one belief that you have it's a belief it's a world of comparison it's where we go into an anticipation that we need to achieve a certain fitness level that is pegged against another individual. So when we're often going into comparison, it's a brilliant self-sabotage mechanism to stay in our status quo. And this is what I'm saying, by the way, guys, this applies to all areas of life. This applies to your career. This applies to your confidence in a relationship. This applies to how you are in, in a marriage or in your uh, speaking skills or whatever it may be, there is strong evidence in your mind that reinforces why you should stick exactly where you are. The second belief that you also have, which is a hidden belief there, is you also have this view of the fitness instructor himself that he is, and he is the definition of fitness. I promise you if you went and spoke to that guy and you invited him to some fitness challenges, he will say, oh, no, no, no I'm not yet there yet. I remember I had that view of my personal trainers when I used to go to Easy Gym. And I remember going there and I had just come back from Kilimanjaro. And I did Kilimanjaro at 100 kilos. And coming down Kilimanjaro, doing it at 100 kilos, I was left with, damn, this thing called Kilimanjaro is not that hard. I have it that most human beings cannot do this. That's why when people do it, it is a big thing to talk about. The reality and the statistics gave me more evidence because only 65-70% of people who attempt Kilimanjaro actually summit it, right, of all total climbs. Uh, we've now taken 40-something people up that mountain in uh, three or four treks, and we have had between 80 and 100% summit rates. We've had uh, only one was 80%, and the others were 100% summit rate, uh, and so uh, including a nine-year-old girl. So we can completely debunk that. And when I came down from Kilimanjaro on a Monday, about two weeks after coming down, or three weeks after coming down, my mates who never would invite me to something adventurous and fit, but they just heard I came down from Kilimanjaro, they're lean, they're athletic, they're runners. They said, hey, we're doing this thing called Tough Mudder. Would you like to join? I didn't know what Tough Mudder was, but just the name Tough and Mudder sounded like, damn, this must be brutal. And I said, you know what? I just did Kili. What's the worst that could happen? Because I experienced in Kili, there are moments where you think you're close to death and you don't actually die. And so I said, you know what? Fine, I'll do it. And I said, yes, on a Friday or a Thursday night. On a Friday, I went for a 5K run and Saturday was Tough Mudder. And I did Tough Mudder. And one of the leanest, most athletic looking guys, tall and slim uh, guy, he pulled his back by mile three and I pulled off the full 12.8 miles. And, and I promise you in 2014, guys, if anyone's done Tough Mudder recently, they're now five kilometers and 10 kilometers they used to be 12.8 miles. Uh, so they were, they were pretty, pretty brutal. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was long and it did take a lot of time and take, take a lot out of us. So, um, and, and I did that. And I realized when I did that, I came and told my personal trainers in the gym, I said, hey, you guys want to do Tough Mudder? It was awesome. And my personal trainers who I look at and idolize and worship as you guys are the epitome of fitness and anything that's possible with the human body, they said, oh, no, no, Tough Mudder, no, 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 we can't do that stuff. That's crazy. You've got to be kidding me. I can't do that. And I was just like, wow, the penny dropped for me. I'm sitting here thinking that it takes a certain type of person, a certain type of physique uh, to do a certain thing. 
and it's completely at the mindset and perception level. It's completely influenced by our beliefs. So that said, let me very quickly go into my journey. Those of you who, who know me and like Amr recalls me from this looking like this in 2014. And uh, this is me living life as a fat banker. Uh, and I thought was the definition of success. And the gap between these two photos is, uh, I think the gap between these photos is about uh, eight or nine months, but my bulk of my transformation happened in about between five and a half and seven months. October 2014, I joined the gym and that photo was in uh, April, May or June of 2015. So I worked with in fine banking and finance. I had a career there for about 12 years. Uh, last six of which were with JP Morgan. I was vice president there. It was a great career. I loved it. I really enjoyed my time there and I had no view or perception of it as being stressful. It was long hours. I got to travel a lot. I got to work a lot. We worked hard and we partied harder, much like the image in the bottom right corner. Uh, that's not really us, but that's from the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, but we did have some fun parties. And uh, living that life and what I thought was a life of success, who I wound up being with those hours, that lifestyle, that nutrition, the eating out, the drinking out, was this guy here, this fat banker. And still able to put a nice smile on my face, still able to uh, enjoy a lot of what life and that lifestyle afforded us. Uh, and underlying this, underlying that smile, underlying this guy, was a view that I just got to make the most of what I have. I got this body and there's nothing much I can do about it. So I would still party. I would still take an adventure. Like I mentioned, I did Kilimanjaro, still at 100 kilos. And I would still pose like Daniel Craig coming out of the beach uh, in New Zealand. And uh, I used to do such things because it was, it was, great, to, uh, it was great to use self-deprecating humor to not be responsible for something. So I, I invite you guys to look at where in your, your life, when your conversations, have you said to people something that is a joke that diminishes or demeans you, right? So you speak down to the greatness of your body and your being, and you're like, Oh, yeah, 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 you know, I'm one of those lanky ones, or I'm one of those guys who, uh, when they say, oh, you're out of shape, and you say, well, round is a shape, you know, that's the kind of stuff I would say. Stuff that would have me not be responsible with owning that conversation, or owning what somebody's calling me out on. So we use humor to deflect, actually acknowledging, you know what, I've got something that's not working in the area of health, and I'm committed to transforming that. And so living that life, as a banker, I was newly married to some amazing lady called Ambika, and we were nine months married. Uh, we're still married, by the way. She's here uh, next to me with a, with a baby. Uh, but we were uh, in Edinburgh celebrating at the Fringe Festival. It was a birthday, so I booked this place. I booked this nice hotel. We were going to watch the Fringe Festival. We were going to Fringe Festivals where all the comedians and performances and circuses and everything is happening. And so we're there to celebrate the birthday. We're also there to celebrate that we were three months pregnant. It was awesome. It was uh, really great news for us. We were looking forward to it. And I, I was thinking at the time, you know, life is pretty straightforward. I come from, from Zambia. I didn't go to university per se. I got a professional qualification. I landed a job at JP Morgan. I was vice president. Uh, I got this beautiful wife. Nine months into marriage, we're expecting a, a baby. Um, I said, life is so beautiful and straightforward. And this future that lies ahead, looking for the little one to come around. And um, it's pretty easy. And while we're there and everything was going well, and I thought that was the definition of success, we had a miscarriage and we lost the little one. Right. And it was a crushing moment for Ambika and for me. Uh, and we had no friends and family around. We're in this small box in our hotel room. And I was completely helpless in, able, in being unable to stop her, to control my own emotions, to, to grieve at the same time, as well as address her grief. And from that, I started getting these random heart palpitations that night and the following night, the following morning, and on the train back, they carried on. And I remember telling Ambika, and I'm not present in that moment, to this is a mom who's just lost her baby. And I'm saying to her, I'm, I've got these heart palpitations, but you know what, I'm just going to drink some water, I'll do some deep breathing, and I should be all right in the morning. And uh, to which she immediately screamed. She goes, there's no way... I'm waking up tomorrow having lost another one. And for the first time, it really hit me how most of us go through life thinking and making personal decisions about ourselves as though it's only us who matters. There are others that bank on our fitness, hence the name Fit Banker. 
fit banker is not just for bankers it is for people it's everyone a fit banker is somebody that gets that others in the world bank on their fitness and therefore they ought to be their optimal self whether you're a lawyer whether you're a mom whether you're an entrepreneur whether, whether you're in it your role in your company is crucial your role in your family is crucial your role to your parents your siblings or your children is crucial and when you get that you just want to use this vehicle you want to keep your tesla in prime condition you want to keep your your rolls royce or your bmw or your uh your fiat uno in prime condition you're going to take care of that vehicle and knowing that was the turning point for me and hearing that line from ambika where she was not having any of it any of it made me say you know what this so isn't the definition of success and i started researching nutrition mindset ayurveda body the science of body types uh and i started finding a whole bunch unraveling a whole universe of knowledge i didn't know so our beliefs are a very finite and limited pool of all that there is to know and understand and when you start to call yourself out that you know nothing about a particular area then you begin to open up your mind to say there is actually stuff out there to learn and discover and it begins to show up for you these things are sitting in your blind spots and i began to take uh, and implement what i learned i threw myself into this body transformation challenge that i found online on, on facebook and i yeah, have it after hey rocky we can hear you now i'll have mine after i'll do mine half now i've got a piece of work no i'll do this first for this now Then I'll do. Hey Rocky, sorry we could hear you. I've just put you on mute. Um because there was some background noise coming from from you. Okay. And then that was the birth of Fitbanker. And Fitbanker really is this. It's an organization to uh coach, empower and educate people to learn how to bank on their fitness. And that's what we're committed to. And we exist, we offer online health coaching programs, we run monthly tracks and we run leadership programs and adventure summits on Mount Kilimanjaro and this year we're doing Machu Picchu as well so we did Mount Kilimanjaro twice and we're doing Machu Picchu and it's been an absolute privilege to be able to go into something where i get to contribute to shifting the trajectory of human beings and when i say human beings i thought like this is what the medical system is for this is what doctors do well guess what happened when i started this program this lady here on the left is a doctor she signed up to this program she's a doctor a gp physician from the us takes on a program she loses 9.1 kilos she's a mom of two she's busy she has long hours stressful lifestyle american working culture and even as a doctor she wasn't the embodiment of what she stood for health she does our program and loses 9.1 kilos she then fast forwards uh you know she's now even this was in 2015 2016 when she did her first program with us this january she came back because she wanted to again get back into momentum so she's currently on a january challenge that's running right now uh they had their webinars this week uh this is elisa somebody who is italian i remember people saying that oh you'll never get an italian to do your program because uh they can never give up pizza or pasta and um and 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 that was a belief a view a belief people have and she took on the program she took on her health she lost 11 and a half kilos in 90 days but then she went on to lose up to 20 kilos and she went on to go into acting people pursue a passion that they have so i always invite people to say look at what's possible if you took on transforming your health what could open up for you next like what would open up for you i took on transform my health and what opened up is a whole new career a whole new life that i get to live uh fast forward 3 years later we very healthily and successfully uh, naturally conceived a new little baby who's now kanaya he's now almost turning 3 in, in a couple of weeks time and we've got baby number 2 on the way and i'm i'm grateful i'm privileged that at 40 i'm becoming a dad again uh, and i'm probably going to go for a lot more because i love little ones uh, and i have uh, the the energy and the life around me to to be around for them uh, and these guys who are called the fit doctors they came down to london to give a ted talk i didn't know them before somebody said you got to meet this guy uh, called uh, ronnie runs fit banker we caught up for dinner I explained the science of what we do and some of what we'll cover here today and they took it on the guy on the left lost 53 pounds the guy on the right lost 36 pounds and today this is four years on they now look and feel ambassadors these guys the guy on the right jamin brumbert is a regular appearance on fox news in the us <coughs> and then this is simran somebody all her life has been overweight from when she was young under 10 to a teen and 
believed that no, nothing she did would ever shift. She took on our program, lost 15.8 kilos, and then went out of participating in the design of the program. She gained a few kilos back. She came back. She signed up to Kilimanjaro. She started training again. She lost another 10 kilos. So ultimately, she was at a 20 kilo lighter than her first challenge, and she took on Mount Kilimanjaro. Again, something she's never done a mountain. She's not into trekking, but her belief systems are completely shifted as to what's possible by her and the human body. And she goes on to do something like this. And most of us have a view that you need to be some athlete or you need to be some other perspective of what's possible for you. So as you, as you listen to this webinar and as you think about what you want in your health, think about what's possible that you could go on to do. And I want you to consider that whatever you even think is possible, you're playing small. So just be, just be connected to what would then be available for you if you shifted your health, your physique, your energy levels, your strength levels. Uh, our focus has always been on health. This is somebody who we've reversed pre-diabetes. She got gestational diabetes from her third uh, pregnancy and third child, and she was told she will not be around for the third born's 10th birthday because of a blood sugar level. She took on a program and she lost 14 or, or more kilos, and she reversed her pre-diabetes completely free of it, and her confidence, she's now in a new career, which is a realtor. She actually works as a phlebotomist, which was in a lab. This is somebody who struggled with fertility issues. She was told by the IVF clinic they will not start the IVF process on her because she needed to lose weight. Uh, and she tried everything for a whole year, Did lost only three kilos. They still declined her joining. She does a program, and by week 10, she's lost eight kilos. She's approved to IVF. By end of the program, she's successfully conceived. And she en wanted one more child. They ended up having twins. I flew out to Zambia to interview this person, and lo and behold, uh, while we were there, because they were told they could never conceive naturally, they never used to have uh, protected sex. And what happened is that they ended up getting baby number four, their first natural baby. So now she's gone from one to four babies in a window of 20 months, which is just a true miracle. Uh, and this guy is who I call old man. This is my dad, is, uh, and he at 70 took on a program. And from as far back as we can remember, he's been on high cholesterol and high BP medication, statins, and he does a program, loses 17 and a half kilos at the age of 70. He's a lot more active now. He's now turning 75 in about uh, four days' time. And he has been off medication for now four years. And I'm very privileged and grateful that we've got the old man still around and off his medication. So how does it work? There are rules. There are sciences. There are principles around food, around our body, around exercise. And when you know them collectively, we get the rules of the game, then all you have to do is play better than anyone else. And, and the game that we're calling is called, this is a lifestyle education and it lasts a lifetime. We just happen to be delivering it to you over 90 days. But this is a lifestyle and lifetime education. So, so remember that as we go through, what we're offering is something to be around and last around for you forever. And we will tell you what what what's necessary to keep it in action to keep you in action so how do you first rewire the mind to rewire the mind you need to understand how your mind got wired the way it got wired in the first place so we have what's called the connection of our decisions and our beliefs in our mind are, are collectively known as what we call a mental construct and how it was formed was as a kid you have an experience and you form an interpretation and mine was it was sports day at school and they were selecting and calling out the names of everyone in class and the sport they were doing. So they call out the 100-meter race, the relay, the high jump, the long jump. They even called the sack race. They still didn't call me. Then they went to the egg and spoon race, and they still didn't call my name. And I'm like, damn, when are they going to call me? And they finally called my name, and the race I'm doing is called the memory race. And I'm like, what on earth is the memory race? Uh, I didn't say that. I was like six or seven or eight years old. And I realized that what we have to do is you stand at the start line, you walk, you don't even run. They make you walk five meters or 10 meters to look down into a box. And there's a big Pandora's box of a lot of colorful things in there, stationery and toys and other items. And you have to memorize visually as many items as you can, come back to the start line and write down as many things as you saw. Whoever wrote down the most wins the race. And I remember making a decision as a kid saying, hmm, I'm not brainy, I, I, I'm not sporty, I'm brainy. And fast forward a few years, I moved to a new school, and I go to a new school, and I want to fit in. And it's lunchtime, and they're choosing teams to play football over the lunch break. And as they're choosing the teams, 
everyone picks, the two captains are picking one person at a time, and everyone gets picked. And they didn't pick me, I'm the last person. And they finally picked me because they needed to match the numbers to make even teams. And I have more repeat evidence. You know what? I'm trying to fit into this new school with these new kids. And and they don't choose me. They must think I'm crap at football. They didn't select me at, at the start. Why did they pick me last? And I made a decision that since I'm doing, doing school anyway in class, and these guys don't have any expectations for me in sport, you know, sod them. I'm not uh, athletic. I'm academic. And I made that decision. And I live through my life with that fixed template. So every time something happens, we make these, these synapses fire in our brain. It forms a neuronal pathway. Those two brain cells fire and connect. The more and more of those happen, we form a full pathway of those neurons. So when anyone speaks of a topic in that subject, you are already fixated on how you will present yourself in that arena. So when I'm in at 30 or 29, 28, and I'm in JP Morgan, and it's lunchtime, and two of my colleagues say, hey, we're going for a lunch, a run at lunch. Would you like to join? First thing that comes up to me is who on earth does that at lunchtime in the city? Growing up in Africa and Zambia, it's not a thing you did. And so they're doing this suddenly at JP Morgan. And I immediately have all the, the defense mechanisms and all the rationale as to why I will not go. Oh, sorry, I can't do it. No, I won't come. What was really going on internally is five minutes into the run, I will be out of breath and I will slow these guys down and I will be sitting on a pile of guilt that I said yes and I didn't keep up with them. I really would love to go. But there was no way I was going to go through that humiliation or even them coming back after lunch and saying, yeah, we went for a run. It should have been 30 minutes, but Ronnie took an hour and a half or something like that. And I didn't want to live with that because my mind, this mental construct was already formed and made strong over the past 20 something years of my routine. Now, how do you break that? Most of us, all of you, all that you're saying, you have this fixed mental construct. How are we going to snap that? We have to create what's called a paradigm shift. And there are three steps to transformation. And you want to write this down. The first one is awareness. So acknowledge what is there. So when I asked you at the start, that was an intentional question. What is it you believe to be true about why you are where you are and cannot be where you want to be? And acknowledge what's there. So acknowledge your current beliefs. So today's webinar and, and the, the Fit Banker program on webinar one, on this webinar, which is a, a free info webinar, we have actual slide extracts from the actual program where the first webinar we're looking at the background, the history, and the limiting beliefs that we were raised with and we exist with. So number two is replace the existing. So find a model that works out there, that we've seen work out there for others, okay? And adopt that model. Take it on, replicate it, make your version of that model. Make sure that model has aspects and actions and habits and belief systems and content that are outside what you already know. Because if you're going to do more of what you already know, it's the same old BS. And the third one is discover from that new model through your experiences and share it out there. You see, the best way to learn something is to learn it in order to teach it. So if you learn it in a way that you can recreate for another, it gets reinforced in our brain. And through that, we start to create this new mental construct. And when you have this new mental construct, you're completely going to operate aligned with this new belief system. You see, I took on transforming my health at 34. At 35, we launched FitBanker. I turned 40 about three weeks ago. And I today still, I'm feeling fitter and stronger than I've ever been. And I'm grateful. And I've maintained that. This is not like a, a fad diet. This is not something that we volley up and down on. Like, I have such power and clarity around when I'm not picking the chocolate cake because who I am for people, my why, Tunde, we spoke about this. I said, Tunde, get a very empowering why. I know that I'm somebody that is, in my life, I believe we can transform and disappear lifestyle disease. I created very recently and confidently that, okay, in my life, I'm going to be a billionaire by serving a billion people and not just to do good. Money is just a vehicle. It's fuel to a car, right? And, and we will be doing through a business, creating and having this education go worldwide. Like we want it in corporates, we want it in schools, we want it in universities. It should be taught everywhere. And if I have to be the person behind that, there is no way I want to slip up or eat junk or get drunk or trash myself because my body and my mind and my intellect matter that they're always in optimal condition.
So that's the context I want each of you to look at. When, when you sign up to the program, we're not going through that today, but when you sign up to the program, we ask everyone to create what's called an empowering why. It might be that you look around you and look at the family and the lives and the people that depend on you, right? The, the employees, the customers, the bosses, the employers that, that depend on you. When you get who banks on your fitness, you'll begin to love yourself a teeny weeny bit more. And that is a big confidence boost. So here are some of my other limiting beliefs that I had evidence for. And some of you might also have this evidence in your family. I would see my dad being fat and overweight. And I was like, damn, when I was getting fat and overweight, I blamed him. I said it was this thing called genes. I said, dad, I've got your genes. Because of you, I am fat and overweight. And I believed I had the fat gene. It was so real for me. But guess what? When I Googled fat gene, which one is the fat gene? Can I get my fat gene operated out? There is no such thing as a fat gene. It's an informal term that's used in, in magazines like Cosmopolitan. And uh, I don't know what other silly magazines get chucked around that we read and pick up. Uh, damn, I admit it, I read Cosmopolitan. But basically, it is a false made-up term to refer to people that, that the world made them think themselves that we are just a certain way and we're stuck that way. So not true. The moment I got that was false, I replaced it with whole new information and content, transformed me. But not only did I do that to make sure that the next generation after me is healthier, I got to pay it back to the prior generation, which is my dad. And he took on the program, as I showed you earlier, lost his 17 kilos and is now a lot more fitter and healthier than he's ever been. This is another one I had. Life is unfair. And I'll explain what I mean by this. Me and Ambika would go out, we would party, we would eat nice Italian, have some pizza, pasta, salads, and then we would go and party and have loads of alcohol. And we would, she could dance the night away, she would have loads of energy, she'd be life of the party, and the morning after, she's perfectly fine. Whereas in my case, that meal makes me feel sluggish, lethargic, uh, I probably have to excuse myself from the crowd uh, to go and, and, and release some bloated gas, and in the morning after, I put on half a kilo. And I was like, damn, life is unfair. I mean, I could eat less than Ambika, but she can party the night away. Her food translates for her as energy and, and, and life and living it up. And for me, it's sluggishness, lethargy, and the next day I put on half a kilo. Why the hell is this happening to me? And I was like, this is absolutely unfair and life is ridiculous. Remember, whenever we have a belief, we need to find another piece of information that will debunk our current belief system. And I found this out. That from ancient Ayurveda, and it's also there in science, in Western science, but it's not, it's not being shared a lot about. It's called the science of body types. The science of body types suggests that we all have a particular body type. In Eastern science, it's called Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, and in Western science, it's called uh, ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. And that body type comes with a certain metabolism. And as you guys are watching the slide, you might actually see and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm that kind of a body type. Now that body type has certain traits that work for it and certain traits that work against it. That body type has certain foods that serve it, and certain foods that really work against it. And all I was doing was, I am a kapha body type, which is the lady in green here, and uh, on the bottom is the endomorph body type. And that body type doesn't has a metabolism that doesn't do well with certain foods. And I was consuming those foods, whereas my wife Ambika is what's called a vata and vata pitta body type or an ectomorph or ectomesomorph. So she could eat a lot and has a very high metabolism and it wouldn't show. But we cannot eat the same. We're all so unique, but we've grown up in an education system that's giving all of us the same information. And that's where it began. That's where we all got corrupted from following very generalized and standardized content with all good intents and purposes was put into our school curriculum and our education, and there have been policies and campaigns by health bodies and the NHS because they want to simplify it so everyone understands it. But the downside with simplifying it so that it applies to everyone is that we are all so unique. We're different by height, even the four of us on this webinar, we're different by height, we're different by weight, we're different by what we do in the lifestyle, we're different by our stress levels, we're different by the levels of responsibility that we have. It's completely different. Why then would we follow one standard set of guidelines this used to be called the eat well plate. We learned about it in school. 
And recently they, they said, we're revamping it. We're going to reinvent that. And they called it the Eat Well Guide. What they did was they took up the fork and the spoon. They changed some of the ratios of this. Uh, and at the bottom there, they have this funny thing which says, women should have 2,000 calories and men should have 2,500 calories. You know, that's completely BS. If I consume 2,000 calories a day, my body gets groggy, doesn't move, and I put on weight. That is so way over what's called and what science will tell us today is called our TDEE, Total Daily Energy Expenditure. And you can calculate it or you can use an app like MyFitnessPal and you can figure that out. And this app is telling everyone should have X amount of bread and potatoes and starch and white carbs, X amount of dairy uh, and milk, X amount of protein and lentils and pulses, X amount of vegetables, and then cheeky snacks are outside the guide, uh, and then six to eight glasses of water a day. I mean, how could we say that? We're so different. Every day is different, right? A sedentary day for me is different from an active day. And so that's where what we bring in and coach on is called transformative health. Transformative health is educating you on your uniqueness. And so you really need to understand you. You need to understand your lifestyle. You need to understand your body type, which one you are. We uh, have you look now at what you're made of inside your body. So we have a certain body composition, which means we are made up of predominantly, all of us are made up of three things, which is bone, fat, and muscle. And knowing what percentage of muscle or fat you are, we can alter those. We can alter those from a starting point, and we can alter those to where you need to be. And you, we have scales, bioelectrical impedance scales, or sometimes your gyms have those machines, or you can order them from Amazon, or you can go into a Boots, and Boots will tell that for you. We also coach you on multiple muscle groups. You know, your muscle is not only that hour you spend in the gym. What really makes the difference is the 23 hours outside the gym. That's where we come in. If you think about it, your day doesn't get shifted by one hour in the gym. It's what we're doing for majority of the day, the 23 other hours. So we coach you not just on the physical, but also the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual muscle. And that's some of our what our coaching includes. We teach you what's called functional eating, how to eat food that plays a role and function based on your level of activities and the type of activities in that day. If you are sitting, you will have a very different macro profile. If you are going and doing a CrossFit class and doing a 5K run, you'll have a very different uh, macro profile. Uh, and if you don't understand that, we coach you and that we explain to you how to do that. So let's have a look at altering our body composition the first thing that we said we look at or is unique about us so all of us have two types of fat we have what's called subcutaneous fat and visceral fat and the visceral fat is the fat around our organs and our blood vessels and it can be fatal it's what gives us immediate lifestyle disease like high blood pressure cholesterol uh, and is a precursor to many other longer term illnesses uh, then the subcutaneous fat is the extra fat underneath our skin which is also harmful but not very short term. It, it has an impact longer term. It has an impact on things like our joints and later years of uh, um, osteoarthritis and other uh, joint issues as well as, as well as other lifestyle disease that would kick in for us. So knowing where you are as a starting point is good to know uh, because we don't all start off with the same fat percentage. So two of you on this uh, dialing in might both be like 34 years old. You might both have um, same height, but one of you has 34% body fat and the other one has 24% uh, body fat. And you both want to get under 19. So as you can imagine, to do that in 90 days is going to require a different plan and program for you to get there or different uh, macro or calorie goals for you to get there. So knowing that we all are unique and different and have different starting points is crucial for us to understand. So just so people know, people always ask me, what do I need to get to? in terms of fat percentage, very high level, I'll, I'll share here, to go from persons on the left to those on the right. For men, we want to go between 40 to 45% muscle mass. So you want to write this down in case you have access to one of these machines or if you can order one. And um, uh, Raki, there's a mic button at your end. If you press that, just to mute yourself. I can mute you from here, but I unmuted you in case you had any questions. Okay, I've just done that. Um, so, and our fat percentage for men, uh, I'm going to go with, with most men, uh, most of you that I dialed in on here are somewhere um, between the age range of 20 to 40. 
you will your healthy fat percentage range is from 11% body fat to 19% body fat so take note of that that's the overall fat which is subcutaneous as well as visceral uh, your visceral should be somewhere between 1 and 9 part of our fat that we need in our body is essential we need that anyway and some of it is excess so the this person on the right has 3% plus 4% he has a total of 15% body fat he is between 11 and 19 so that person would be healthy the lady on the right, for women, it's between 21 and 33. And so she has 12 plus 15, which is 27 of total fat. And that is within the healthy range for that uh, woman. Now, women generally have a higher percentage, um, uh, just because of their anatomy being different. And, uh, and we will tell you what yours is based on your age. And we have a chart that we provide you. Now, how do we shift from this person on the left to this person on the right? The answer is accountability. And what do I mean by accountability? We use two apps, one to track your energy that's coming into your body, which is the food that you're taking in, and one is to track the energy going out. So we use two particular apps called MyFitnessPal and RunKeeper, and um, uh, and we, we don't go by its default settings. We make some modifications to the standardized setting of it. Uh, uh, Tunde, I think you've already set yourself up on my fitness pal you added me as a friend you can also add me guys as fit banker yeah it will allow you to see my food diary what i eat and so on and my levels of activity on run keeper uh but i won't go into too much detail right now but it is something we coach on on the program and we support you and we have a coach that checks in with you to see how you're doing ultimately what we're looking for is this is a screenshot from my fitness pal on the left that thing which says gold 1700 is we're trying to that's called our total daily energy expenditure. We're trying to make sure we consume that amount of calories in a day to stay the same. Every time we eat, it reduces our allowance. And every time we exercise, like in this case, he burned 273 calories from exercise, he increases his allowance to have more food if he wants to stay the same. If you want to lose weight, you will be eating less than 1,700. Therefore, you will have a remaining, like here, they have a remaining of 864. Uh, if you want to gain weight, you will have your remaining be in red. It will be a negative number. Now, the, the mathematical formula to literally disappear a pound of fat from your body is to create a calorie deficit of 3,500 calories or to burn 3,500 calories. Now, how do you do that? You macro track everything across the week. You, to do that in a day is very hard unless you're climbing up Mount Kilimanjaro with me. But if you did it uh, across a week, you could do an average of 500 calorie deficit a day. And so we recommend that every day people look that they're between 300 to 800, and that will give them an average of 500. We always tell people not to undereat and not to skip meals because that will put your body into what's called starvation mode. In fact, it will make your body more efficient at storing fat, which is not what we want. So uh, that is the accountability that we bring in. Secondly, um, I'm going to go very quickly over the next three or four slides, but these are some of the values or principles or habits we invite you to commit to and we provide you a structure with your teammates, that are meaning other people on a program and your coaches, of how to declare and commit to something verbally and then take action aligned with that. So the first one is goals, right? Uh, you want to shift something, you have to know where you are. So I might ask you guys, what are your strength goals? You might say to run uh you know five kilometers under 30 minutes or you might have a goal which is to uh to lift 100 kilos right the starting point to that is you have to know what you're currently doing so so measure your current strength and energy goals measure how many push-ups you can do in a minute or how many push-ups max you can do measure how long you can plank measure how long it takes you to walk or run five kilometers record that down then declare and create a goal. Say, by day 30, this is where I want to be. By day 90, this is where I want to be. It then gives your mind, gives your body something to work with. Most of us are actually saying, this year I want to get fit. Or most of us are saying, this year I want to lose weight. But your body listens to specificity. So when I've lived my life saying, oh, I, just, you know, I want to be rich, but I don't say it out there because I don't want people to judge me as, oh, this materialistic guy, there isn't something to act upon. If I say I want to become a billionaire by the time I'm 50, I have 10 years to get there. I have, I have a trajectory to play towards. I have something to work towards. And, uh, and that's 
how the body and the mind conform to an internal decision that's been made. So similarly, you want to do that for whatever goals you're setting yourself. Number two is planning. We all, we all hear about planning, and sometimes the first thing that comes up for me, or that used to come up for me about planning, is planning is complex. We've got a lot to plan. And we only make it complex if we make it complex ourselves. Your plan doesn't have to be complex. You can. It's as simple as booking a class on your gym app to say, I'm booked in, and you put that on your calendar. Or you're telling a buddy to say, hey, this week I'm going four days gym, and I'm going to be walking minimum 3.5 kilometers uh, a day for the next seven days. And by end of the week, you've achieved your 25-kilometer walking goal or whatever goal you might create as an example. So giving your word to something, putting it in your diary, telling somebody about it. Uh, the third one is the power of sharing. I shared earlier at the start of the program, the best way to learn something is to share from there. You guys are on this webinar because I shared about my journey. Either you heard me on a stage or you saw it on social media or somewhere I shared what I'm up to, what I've been through. And by sharing that, it you've reached out to me. It attracted people to me, right? And that is, this is the example of this fit doctor. He is one of the greatest share uh, sharers we've known in our, our community. This guy posted two to three times a day, and he lost 53 pounds. He transformed his marriage. When I say that transformed his marriage, uh, and I'm not bragging about this in, like, in a good way, but he was not content in his relationship. He, he got into a new relationship. He's newly married. He has a new kid at, in his late 40s. But the guy looks like he's in his 20s and 30s. He took on transforming himself and flipped his life inside out. And it began by sharing with people in his world around him what he's up to. And that's very different. For some people, they get confronted with, oh, I don't want to sound vain or egotistical or to be bragging. That's completely not what this is. All things begin with a bold declaration, including JFK saying, we are going to put a man on the moon, right? When, when presidents and leaders say we're going to go to war, when, um, uh, you know, Thomas Edison or somebody says we are going, or the Wright brothers say we are going to fly, they declare that boldly and daringly, and they keep sharing what they're up to in that arena to keep that flame alive. And that's what we need to learn to do. We need to share that not to impress others, but we need to share to inspire others. Uh, and the fifth one, this is what takes people out of the game. This is what has people not achieve results, even though they might be top performers in their life. Now, all of you that are on here, I promise you there is an area of life where you excel at. There is an area of life where your belief system and the actions that you take aligned with your belief system yield results for you. You are successful in those areas. You are what's called an achiever. Most of us are achievers. The problem or the double-edged uh, sword of this achiever or the achiever's mindset is that when you're so good at something and you do well and you achieve results, when it comes to an area that you're not good at, if you find you're not operating or performing or progressing as fast as you want, you go from all in to all out. So a classic example is we have on our current uh, webinar, we have a current challenge. We have somebody from Hong Kong. He's a, he's a well, multi, multi, multi millionaire. He's, he's playing to be a, become a billionaire. He's doing our program. He's somebody who in the first five minutes of me meeting him signed up to my challenge. Like I've never known the guy before. I met him at a religious camp in India uh, beginning of this month. Uh, Amit uh, Amara was on the uh, Make It Happen course, and I met this guy there. And he's very well accomplished somewhere, but he got busy, he got the flu, he missed webinar one, he missed webinar two, and he could very easily go into, that's it, I'm out, it's not working for me, right? Most of us do that, they take ourselves out of the game. But because we have a coach, the coach is on the call with him, the coach is reassuring him that he's not behind, the coach is briefing him on some of the highlights from those webinars and getting him back in action and on track. And this achievement mindset trap is something we all have. So if the two of you or three of you are about to commit to something or you want to take on your health, look out for this little thing. It will show its head and it will take you out of great your greatness. It will take you out of you stepping into what you're capable of achieving in your life and the area of health. So uh, this slide has some stuff uh, as a little video to share, but we're not going to go into that. I'm just going to talk about that. Um, in terms of questioning our awareness, Think about this. When you were all born as babies, right now I have 
Kanea, who is two and 11 months turning three, he is being fed foods where he has zero question or say over. Similarly, all of us grew up into communities and societies and we ate the way people ate. We ate at the times people ate. We slept when they slept. We did something which was not a design of us. We fit into the design of society. So we didn't question a thing around us. And most of us have gone, grown through life like that. So in webinar one, we look at where that came from. We look at what's called the agrarian revolution. We look at the start of the agrarian revolution. When man discovered seed, because we were default hunters and gatherers, which means our bodies spent about a thousand calories of movement and action to find a thousand calories of food. And the role, our role and our job, we didn't have jobs like an IT role or a law firm or whatever. This vehicle was designed to spend a certain amount of energy to get that amount of energy back in the body to stay in balance and to carry on through life. And we were hunters and gatherers. Uh, but then when we discovered the seed, we learned to find people in our community that would just be the farmers. They would plant the seed, they would grow it. Then they became food manufacturers, became middlemen between them and us. And the food manufacturers then influenced the farming prices and what they bought it at. And they brought cost of production down and they wanted to make profit. And so they make and present us foods that are marketed to us, that we choose, which we haven't actually chosen ourselves. And we just walk into and adopt them. We eat what people eat. And we inherit them from what I call point number two, the three M's. Mums, meaning our culture and our upbringing. Media, we eat what we see in the adverts and the TVs and the TV serials and the programs on TV and the product placements on Instagram. The masses, we do what the masses do. We are by default followers of the herd mentality, even though we say we aren't. You might say you're a rebel, you did something different, you chose a different career, you didn't listen to your parents, you, you might have a whole justification of certain things. And I promise you that everywhere else, where you don't have power, you are caught up in doing what the herd does. You eat what the herd does. If tomorrow you go to work and it's someone's birthday and they bring in a box of Krispy Kremes and it even has a nice, wise and witty thing on there which says, think inside the box, you're like, mm, I like that. And you'll pick up that Krispy Kreme donut and you will eat it. And you will think you are operating smart, but we're completely in the matrix. We're completely operating at the herd level. The third one is our own limiting points of health food fitness exercise that we have so uh, uh, these are questions i want you guys to write down they're part of the awareness I, I may not get the the answers from you on today's webinar in fact i won't get them but i want you to write down there is a view that you have and then to question it so in growing up in an asian family in a background i had a view about food i had a view about what a meal should look like and a meal should look like, and it was reinforced by many sayings that my mom would have. My mom would have the saying, which is, every man should do enough work to earn, to eat two rotis at night. Roti is the chapati, the bread that we eat. And what that meant for me, by that saying, she's talking about money and working hard, but I meant that roti for us has to be in every meal. And I meant that every meal and every plate I have has to have one pile of a vegetable curry, another pile of a vegetable curry, one soup or a dal or a lentil thing or another one, maybe a little salad and a piece of chapati there. When a plate looked like that, that was called a whole meal. It's called a thali. When you have that thali, when you go to an Indian restaurant, you order a thali, they give you a thali. That's the default meal we grew up eating. So for me, my thinking is if a meal doesn't have all these items in there, that's not a whole meal. So if you gave me salads, I would say, what on earth is this? You're giving me rabbit food. You know, why are you giving me such nonsense? That was the view and the world I came from. My old belief system reinforced that, accepted a norm growing up as a kid and what society told me, and I was not interested in debunking that. So you might have a view that I have to have red meat and I might have to have, um, you know, uh, pounded yam. I might have to have uh, ugali or whatever uh, we, we consume as our staple food. I might have to have rice in it. I might have to have noodles in it with our ancestors have been eating this for years i promise you yes your ancestors have been eating it but your ancestors walked about 10 kilometers every day going to work and coming back from work they didn't sit on the london underground they didn't sit in front of a couch and watch netflix at night they went and cleared the garden and did what they have to do they did physical labor and movement that's very different to our lifetime most of us are consuming foods that are twice as many calories as our forefathers consumed and they're much more richer in sugar in salt 
and in bad fats. And then no surprise that we have bodies that are not optimally functioning. So that's an example of the limiting views of food that I had. So here's a question and some questions for you guys. And I want you to write the question down and answer it in your own time. So food is and dash complete that sentence for me and put as many answers that come up for you food is tasty food is necessary food is yum food is whatever comes up for you food or a meal the next one food or a meal should be or should have so food or a meal should be or should have and go on to complete that let me know what comes up there for you in fact in fact i want to hear some of the responses uh, so i'm going to come back and ask you for one of those the third one exercise exercise is and complete that with an adjective or anything that you want to complete that sentence with exercise is and then fourth one i am and complete that with some limiting views you have of yourself like I am flat-footed, therefore I can't run. I am naturally overweight. I am addicted to chocolate. I am whatever, right? Complete, I am, that's a view that you have about you. I am academic, I'm not athletic. I am not as fit as my personal trainer. I am, or I am or I have, right? Or I can, or I cannot, right? Complete that. So I am, I have, I can, I cannot, and what comes there? I cannot run, I cannot swim, I cannot lift heavy weights, I cannot bulk up no matter what I try. Write those down. Okay, if you've written some down, I want to hear what you've written. Who would like to share? You can unmute yourself. Um, as for that, I don't mind sharing. Um, for I am, I've, I've just surprised myself a little bit, but I put I am a binger. Um, so when I I binge on, if I if I exercise, I binge on exercise and give up eventually. And, or if I want to improve myself, I binge on reading and listening to kind of self help stuff and and then give up. And food definitely, I I binge. I mean that's one thing I probably am consistent on. I do binge eat. Um, yeah like i never have before i think it's more something that's come around in the last few years yeah uh, comfort eating and binge binging so it's part of my personality i see myself as a binger yeah got it got it it's brilliant to distinguish that because distinguishing it brings a certain level of awareness and by sharing it now what we've done so i i'm going through in this webinar exactly the things we ask people to do as weekly habits and so when you are now next at a social gathering, you might see this bowl of nachos and you might start taking seven, eight, nine. And by the time you reach the 15th nacho, you'll remember, oh, I said that I'm that. And you'll begin to now observe, you'll begin to be the observer of you and not uh, who you think you are. You'll begin to be the observer of your body and your senses completely dominating a particular situation or scenario. So brilliant that you've distinguished that. Uh, Tunde? Yeah. Um... Nothing came up for me for food is dash for me. Mm -hmm. But the other three, what I came up with was food should be savory. Mm -hmm. um, exercise is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm a, and I'm addicted to sweet stuff. Got it. It's amazing you've written that down. And now I invite you when you go into all of those areas, right? Food should be savory. You begin to look at certain foods that you like that aren't savory. You might go for a walk or run or go for a gym workout. And actually realize, but what is the thing called difficult about this? Like, what is the moment called difficult? What is difficult? Like, you begin to explore, at what point am I meant to die on the floor? You know, I used to have that approach when I'd go to these hit classes, and I would look at them, I'd look at everything set up. I would even make bodily communication with the personal trainer and others in the class when they're explaining the routine. I'd be like, breathing, I'd be like... Oh my, oh God, wish us luck. All right, guys, all the best. You know, we make all these comments to psych ourselves up for 30 minutes of what we thought was going to kill us. And we survived. And we went for another 30 minute class and we survived that. And I was like, shit, that's just made up stuff in my head. That's stuff made up to keep me out of being exposed here. It's 
It's how we take a nine-year-old girl. We took a nine-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl up Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, you know, four months ago. Like there isn't anything that is not achievable by human beings if we've seen other human beings do it. So, um, so that's uh, brilliant that you guys have noted those down. I invite you to look at them. That's the starting point. Now, how do you stay in action? So. So staying in action, starting anything is easy. Getting the knowledge is easy. I mean, all these slides, even if they were given away to everybody or shared with you, they would be easy to read and, and know, but that knowing doesn't make the difference. It's the staying in action. So how do you increase your chances of forming a new lifestyle, forging a new pattern? Uh, firstly, is a public declaration. So sharing what you're up to, sharing with people that you're taking on your health. So they begin to listen to you as somebody who's, you know what, that's it. This year I'm getting a six pack, I'm going for it. Make that bold declaration. Allow people to laugh. I have to make a declaration, I'm going to be a billionaire. And I want to be okay with whatever opin opinions and thoughts and decisions people have out there. Number two is surround yourself with people that are up to what you're up to. Bettering themselves, growing themselves. And I'm not saying you ditch your friends or you leave your family. What I'm saying is find those people like if you go to a CrossFit gym and you become a CrossFit member, you'll find how you'll become addicted to it. If you join the Fit Banker Challenge, you'll find other people from all over the world who are taking on the same. Sharing your actions and your commitment out there. So by sharing what you're up to regularly, right, reinforces the way the world will experience or perceive you. That way you won't feel out of place to say, hey, this is what I'm up to now. Like when you went to do a law degree or when you went to study uh, IT as a career and you were sharing you went to this university or this college and your parents shared your certificate and who's now graduated the world was sharing what we're up to and we ended up fitting into and becoming that person but we're, we're not stuck that way as well so many of us get stuck in what I call the academic trap uh, like I was in banking the more I shared and my in-laws shared and my parents shared oh he's a VP at JP Morgan is doing very well you know he was this way and that way as a child and look at him now the more I was stuck in that trap of conformity. So share what you're up to that's aligned with what you want and who you want to be. And the fourth one is what we call dangle that carrot. And this is a psychological term which is used in the corporate world. Whenever you're about to quit, they're promising you a promotion next year, a better bonus. And when you get that bonus, you're like, oh, that wasn't so great. I could have done better. You start looking around, speaking to agents, uploading your CV, updating your LinkedIn. You then get job offers and interviews, uh, invites and interviews from in April, May and June, you start going for them. By August, September, October, you finalize. In October, you sign the, the contract for the new place. You're about to sign it. And then you think, you know what? I've just accumulated another 10 months of bonus. I'm going to stay on to January. And then you tear up that acceptance letter and you decline that new company and you stay in your company hoping that this year you'll get that promotion and you'll get a better bonus. And guess what? You're still there and it's not didn't please you. And that process stay, stays the same. And that's how I stayed in the career for a long time. But I'm not making the career wrong. I'm, I know it was a trap of my own mind. But if I can use that trap to serve me in the area of health, if you sign up to Tough Mudder or a marathon or Kilimanjaro, and you know you're doing that this August or November, you can you know, believe that you are going to so show up in your training. You're so not going to eat junk. Because you don't want to suffer up that mountain. You don't want to suffer on that marathon. You don't want to uh, not participate or go on that holiday or beach uh, body that you want or whatever you create for yourself, right? That has you stay in action and operate at a particular level. Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So it's a beautiful quote to go by and live by and to keep you in action. On that note, guys, I will wrap up with what the Fit Banker Challenge is, if this is something you would like to join. And I would love to have you guys join our community and meet other like-minded people. If you, um, at the start, there's a body type assessment, which we ask you to do via an online questionnaire. And we uh, ask you to go and get yourselves checked on the scale, get your body composition. We know that. We know your body types. We provide you meal plan ideas based on those and your goals, uh, training programs that you can use in the gym or at home, ab routine. There are 10 webinars much like this. They're either live or recorded. Uh, there's a private online community group of other people that are up to um, the same. You have UK-based trucks during our 90 days. The UK trucks are, are fine. Our next one is a Valentine's truck on 16th February. We're doing a truck from uh, Harpenden 
to we're doing a hop and trek so we're going from king's cross uh, on sunday the 16th if you want details or if you want to join our whatsapp group for trekking let me know uh that's open whether you're not on the fit banker challenge but if you're on the fit banker challenge they're free otherwise it's about 10 pounds for these treks you have direct access to coaching team you have a coach that coaches you and spends 30 minutes of his or her time with you for you like where else do you get that uh, there's a one-to-one -one program we do custom for people that will be between 3 and 5k we only do that on application now it really depends on who we're dealing with and how long that's going on for and then there's a 90-day program which is doing it with a group which is what we recommend and the full price is a thousand pounds and if you're signing up today it's less than half price is i think it's 497 plus the event bright fees and it starts on 24th february and the price goes up the moment the first 10 packs are gone or uh, closer to the start date uh, and like i said it is a lifestyle education that lasts a lifetime so if you'd like to be on it's on our website or you can message me and uh, i can send you the link to sign up to it we, we had a small glitch on our website so i'm just caveating that with message me if you don't see it uh, if you'd like to be on or you just sit on it decide closer to the date if you want to be on you may just pay a little bit more but um but that's entirely up to you uh, on that note i want to leave you guys with this quote about our context of our life the lifestyle we're living and our relationship to wealth and money and how uh, health is truly the real wealth and it always has been the dalai lama when asked what surprised him most about humanity answered man because he sacrifices his health in order to make money then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health and then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present the result being that he does not live in the present or the future he lives as if he is never going to die and then dies having never really lived i am so grateful for the last five years of my transformation and the life i've got to live and the times i've done mount kilimanjaro or a whole host of international speaking opportunities and people we've been able to serve and make a difference to and people we've taken up i would not have been able to do that or reach as many lives in the last five years if i didn't wake up and make this decision to prioritize my well-being uh, on that note guys it's a wrap unless you have any questions or comments uh, we'll be signing out any questions comments guys okay okay Tunde? Uh, nothing just wanted to say thank you for uh, putting this together and i've gained quite a lot from it awesome so they're lovely to have you on thanks for being on as a reminder guys we have uh this and other similar webinars happening wednesday evening next week saturday the following wednesday and the following saturday it's a series of five remaining so now four remaining and they'll be run by either me or one of the teammates um uh, there will there may be some different content on some of the webinars depending on which one you're joining uh but if you uh would like to invite anyone please do share the same link you use to register they can choose the session they're attending and would love to be able to support any family members or friends. And this is something you can also do with your siblings or with your parents or with your partner. Uh, so thanks for being on. Amr, lovely to connect. Let's, let's definitely thanks, connect Anna. as well. Good after this. Yeah, Amr, drop me your number as well in case I've lost it uh, on LinkedIn. Okay. I'll have your details as well. Cool. cool. All right, cool. All right. Thanks both. Have an amazing thanks. Saturday and an amazing rest of the weekend and speak soon. And if you have any queries about the program, let me know. Would love to be able to serve you through the program too. All right. Bye for now. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.